Welcome. This is a little uh, slideshow video. We've already done a little uh, a first glance of the prologue to Romeo and Juliet, and now we're just going to get into just a, a bit more detail. Now, um, you may have already figured out that the prologue of Romeo and Juliet is in the form of a sonnet. That, of course, means it has the rhyme scheme of a Shakespearean sonnet. It uh, is also written in iambic pentameter and follows the basic rules uh, that go with um, the, the quatrains and the couplet for the sonnet. Now, the prologue, like prologues in general, uh, it introduces the setting, main characters, and conflicts. It also introduces the main plot, and it gives us some information about the play. Now, you might think it's a little strange for a prologue to provide information about the plot. It gives kind of a, a general overview, and that's just to put everyone kind of on the same page as to what's happening in the play. All right, my cat is trying to help. Hopefully she doesn't step on the computer. We'll see how this goes. Now the prologue um, in Romeo and Juliet and um, in uh, other Shakespeare of Shakespeare's plays is told by the chorus. Now the chorus is, um, unlike in Greek drama, the chorus in Elizabethan drama is, is just one person. Now this person is often, it's kind of like a narrator. Um, they're often dressed in black, but not, not always. They can wear um, the costume, the costuming that would go with the play or um, other costumes as well. But often they do dress in black because they're kind of in the background. Now the chorus, remember one person enters and exits the stage and they come often uh, between acts of the play to kind of uh, provide summaries, uh, sometimes to maybe ask some questions or make some observations. Now it should be noted that the chorus in Elizabethan drama, which is of course the time period that Shakespeare wrote, is different from Greek drama because the chorus is not just one person in Greek drama. The chorus is a group of performers who stay on the stage um, and they will, they, they may sing, they may dance, perform music, and they do it as a group, as a group. So um, the chorus in Elizabethan drama is just one person, think of it as the narrator, whereas the chorus in Greek drama is a group and this is where we get our modern ideas about the chorus is from Greek drama so a group of people um, often singing dancing etc and uh, they're on the stage the whole time so you can imagine one person maybe coming out and kind of explaining the set and the conflicts uh, and that sort of thing in Romeo and Juliet all right, so here we have, once again, the text to the prologue of Romeo and Juliet. We've already mentioned that it's in a form of a sonnet, so that it's divided up into quatrains. So there's the first, the second, the third, and the couplet. So you've got three quatrains and one couplet. We also know, since it's in the form of a sonnet, that it is written and therefore spoken in iambic pentameter. That means, of course, there are 10 syllables per line, but possibly even more importantly, there's a certain rhythm uh, to, to the prologue. Uh, we also see, of course, that rhyme scheme here, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, G, G, to the end. That means that within a quatrain, every other line rhymes. We've got dignity with mutiny, seen with unclean, foes with throws, life with strife, and so on. We do see an approximate rhyme here with love and remove, telling us that perhaps in Shakespeare's time, these two words might have sounded more similar than they do today. So you'll be hearing this a lot. So you've already read it for yourself. You're going to hear it again as we get into the play of Romeo and Juliet, but let's just listen to it one more time. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadvantaged 
piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife, the fearful passage of their death-marked love, and the continuance of their parents' rage, which, but their children's end, not could remove, is now the two hours' traffic of our stage, the which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. All right, so let's let's get into this. So let's take a look at the first quatrain here. This is where we're getting some background. Two households. Think of a household as a family group, which would include family, extended family, and the servants of those households. Two house households, both alike in dignity. That means that both of these families or households, um, they are of high standing. They're both alike in dignity or standing. So from the nobility. In fair Verona, where we lay our scene, there's the reference to the setting. So we've got fair Verona. Fair in this case would be lovely, beautiful. And of course, that's the city. From ancient grudge, break to new mutiny. Well, an ancient grudge is just an it's an old disagreement. So a grudge is something that, oh, it's um, a, a feeling of ill will toward someone or something. And it's usually, it goes on for a long time. So this is very old, likely goes v back very long so that we get the feeling these two families have been fighting for a very long time. And with the case with grudges, they, they may not even know why it's the, the feud started. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, a mutiny um, it, in the modern sense is when um, we might have people in a lower position rebelling against someone in a position of leadership, but it really can mean any kind of rebellion. So uh, we have this old disagreement, ooh, that is, there's new stuff, it gets, oh, it gets um, brought back. Where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. We've got a play on words here. So civil blood, so civil in the sense of nice, but also citizens. So we've got citizens who are normally very nice, um, but things go wrong. So civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Next we have in this, um, this next quatrain, we've got a bit on what happens in the play from forth the fatal loins of these two foes so foes of course are enemies fatal loins this um, has a, a couple of different meanings so fatal in the sense of causing death that's related to one of our um, vocabulary words but also in the sense of fatal as it, it's meant to be so fate being an outside uh, force that determines the outcomes of events. Now, so from forth the fatal loins of these two foes. Oh, fatal loins. Loins? I don't know if you've ever heard the term gird your loins, but well, that's referring to, well, the important parts of the body. Um, they're around our midsection. So it's talking about, well, reproductive organs. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. So we know that um, the from the fatal loins of the foes, so from the reproduction of these two foes, we've got children. And they are star-crossed lovers. Um, and if, if the, the, the stars are aligning, uh, we know that things are going to go well. But when they're crossed, oh, things don't go so well. Another reference to fate here. And we learn that they take their life. Now, it says, whose misadvantaged, piteous over, overthrows. Um, so this, this um, term, misadvantaged, my cat is scratching at the door. Cat, hold on. Let's not do that now, please. Um, the word misadvantage is also uh, interpreted um, as misadventured. So you know what that means. If something is misadventured, um, that's where the, um, we have just a difference, a little difference in translation. And you might be thinking, translation, it's English. Well, there needs to be some translation from the very old way of speaking to our current day. So, whose misadvantaged, piteous overthrows, so bad stuff happens, um, who doth with their death bury their parents' stripes. We find out that they die, and in their death, the two families, their feud goes away, buries their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love, death-marked another reference to faith there, and the continuance of their parents' rage, which 
but their children's end naught could remove. Basically, this is saying the only way for this feud between these two families to end is the death of their children. So we learned a lot there. Now it switches um, a little bit. Um, so we know that these two star-crossed lovers are going to die, and we know that their death is going to bring together these two families. Is now the two hours traffic of our stage. That's just telling you that the play is about two hours long. Traffic, let's just think of that as action. The witch, if you with patient ears attend, if you listen carefully, what here shall miss, our toil shall strive to mend. So anything that wasn't covered in the prologue, our toil or our hard work as actors shall strive to mend, shall take care of. So whatever isn't covered here in the prologue, we're going to do our best as actors to make sure that you know what's going on. So there's our prologue. Guys, I just threw in, it's sort of hard to see here, but this would be um, a kind of a typical Elizabethan stage um, without curtains all around. You've got people standing here on the floor, the groundlings watching the action, lots of things going back here. You can't see here, but there's probably a trap door. The, the nobility would sit up here. The groundlings would sit here, interestingly. Um, whereas most seats in the house were good to hear things, the best way to see what was going on was probably here on the floor. But the important people, well, they would think they were important, would, would sit up here. All right, you guys, so that's a little uh, additional background and analysis of our prologue. And next, you're going to be listening to a couple different versions of the prologue. And then we're going to get right into Romeo and Juliet, the main part of the play.